Steve. Yes. And I was just saying to Bruce that um, there, is written, there is written documentation mm -hmm. from the period which um, you should have at the Digibar, and I'll make sure you get copies. But for today, yeah. we have programming the link, okay. which Let's is the basic programming manual. This is the second edition from 1969. Okay. I wrote with Wesley Clark, and then okay. the Lap 6 handbook, which is the document for how to run the operating system. The technical report on it. Technical report. Mm -hmm. so, Mary Ellen, who wrote the operating system for the Lap? I wrote the operating system. Yeah, I say, okay. <laughs> That's how I happen to have and these you, documents. And you wrote it at home, correct? I did write it at home, yes. Ah. And, and, and we're, we're in trying to. In Baltimore. Yes. In, in your parents' house? Yeah. In okay. your parents' house. And you had the computer at your parents' house? Yep. Yeah, right so there the, in the living room. Arguably the first room. home yeah. personal computer. That's what some seem to believe. I so I don't know of any other times <laughs> when that was uh, when that happened at that in that era. Yeah. Yeah, so. I, I think oh I asked I asked Bob Taylor and could could this have been the first <laughs> computer in a private residence and he said yes, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It was just, I was just putting off moving to St. Louis to join the other guys. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I and I stayed at home. I just lived at home for a year because I wasn't yeah. sure I wanted to move to St. Louis. And it was yeah. by the staircase. So yeah, you, I was in the living room next yeah. to the staircase up to the second floor. Were you programming all night to? Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. 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 I'm a night owl anyway. So, yeah. so, so the home power was fine for it. You had enough power was fine. Yeah. And it was a very old. The house was 150 years old. Wow. Well. Just had you know, a plain probably 15 amp electrical circuits, lighting circuits, but it was, fine. it was designed to run on just plugging the wall. Kind of what did your parents think? Yeah, of it? what did they think of it? Oh, they, my father, who was a clergyman, thought this was absolutely fabulous. Really? He what? loved having the link in the, in the living room. And he told everybody that he had a computer, and he said, I'll bet you don't have a computer in your did, living room. I have a computer in my did room. He, did he announce it to his... his yeah. uh, Not from the pool. Not from the pool. <laughs> <laughs> Do people believe? To my knowledge, I mean, it's almost like if you told someone in those years, "We have a computer in our house," they would say, "You know, what other jokes do you have today?" Yeah, yeah, they wouldn't believe yeah. it. No, no. We had a lot of people came through the house anyway, just to, visit uh, us to, 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 to look at it. Oh yeah, well, not just to see it. Who would, would have been there anyway? So. That's funny. Were you? Were you a Star Trek fan? Uh, I was. Yeah. 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 I don't think he was. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because yeah. 65 is when you were doing it. Yeah. 65 Yeah, the computer was at Byway, which was the name of that house, in 65, I think, for almost a year. Well, yeah. a year, wow. Well. Yeah, I lived there for about a year, and then I did finally move to St. Louis. Yeah. And you wrote the operating system there? Yeah, yeah, on the cool. earlier version of the, you know, one earlier version of the, that was really just an assembly program, not a whole operating system. Right. That was that was the available software. It's, it's an assembler. Yeah. No, well, it's but an assembly. It assembles for binary <laughs> programs. But it also you could do basic functions for the tape functions. Oh, a lot of, all the, kinds oh, oh, no, of the editing. Commands. The editing is very powerful. The editing is very powerful. I'm going to talk about that today. Um, and that's an algorithm that was developed by Severo Einstein and Mish Stuckey. They thought of how to do it. I was it a full implemented. screen editor? Yeah. You yeah. did a screen yeah. editor? Yeah. Okay. yeah, it was a full screen editor. You needed the screen, you needed the keyboard, and you needed the tapes, particularly. Um, but it's a very sophisticated editing algorithm that just... Um, so you did insert it's a continuous delete. string. You know, a continuous, continuous string. string. You just, we just broke the string, and you could type <laughs> wherever the string was located, just like you can today when you put a cursor, when you move a cursor around on sure. a block of text, yeah. you can type right there or you can delete right there. Huh. We call, I call it locating the manuscript. Wherever the manuscript is located, you can just type. But the paper is about the manuscript, yeah. programming yeah. the manuscript. Scroll editing. Yeah. Scroll editing. Yeah. And, and you had yeah. line breaks. Yeah. How did you move up and down lines? Scrolling. Just scrolling. You just scrolled. Like so you do. Uh, today. There weren't any cursor keys that we got. No, there were. You could. There were two ways to locate the manuscript. One was to give it a line number. Lat six auto, arb, assigned line numbers to every line. They weren't part of the manuscript. It was just a counter that kept track of the lines. Um, and you could tell it to go to a certain line. Right. Which would be maybe approximately where you want it to be. Right. You know, now like you might, we didn't, we couldn't search on particular words, but now you might search for particular words or a chapter heading or something. And then when you got near where you wanted to be, then you could, under key control, you could go forward or backward a page or a line until you got to exactly where you wanted okay. to be. 
and uh, then you can spin it right there. Yeah. And, and then there were a bunch of uh, called meta commands okay. for moving manuscripts around, saving manuscripts, so replacing manus manuscripts. Manuscript was the name of, of the, the, the code or the document, the document, the, document. Or the text, whatever this text was. That and the you text would be could be lap six. It could be anything. Program. It could be a link program. Program or a lot of it was programs. It could be some, anything. Took any any kind of characters, any line length. What any kind of output devices, printers, and things were it? Most anybody had for the first couple of years was a, a, a teletype printer. Teletype, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, not very satisfactory. Later on, people had better printers and stuff like that. But. Yeah. Uh, um, Did you use the screen uh, for interface um, on the on the link much? Or was that? Oh no, that was critical. That was it. That was, it. That was, that was the interface. Was just really, the you first. See Maury doing it now. Yeah. 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 So it was all directly. Whatever you type, that's what you saw, and that's what was in the manuscript right there. Wow. Um, now here's a, a question: To get uh, screenshots, did you actually have a camera mount? Yes, they mounted a camera right on the face. Right of the Right on the face of the screen, so they could actually shoot uh, the link and get tables and charts and things that were produced right, right. And, and put them in publications. Yeah. Yeah. You have some in the slides yes. for today. The and ones that are nice and sharp and clear are the ones that were taken right on the It's like a bell curve. In the there's a bell side. curve, there's a list of, I think it's like a data point for some of these data. There's one of the meta commands and some of the rest of the slides which mm. copy the data or copy something. Mm. Did you work on computers before the link? Yes, I had worked, I had spent a, a year at Lincoln Laboratory working with a different group and programming the IBM 704 or 709, mm -hmm. I think both of those machines. Mm -hmm. And then when I was assigned to the group, this group that actually did the link, which was then the TX2 group at Lincoln, yeah. um, I learned to program the TX2. And in fact, my first job with regard to the whole link project was to simulate the link on the TX2. So we had the link fully simulated on the TX2. Amazing. Uh, so the first programs were written on the link simulator on the TX2. We didn't have any huh? software on the link for a while. And the simulator um, went through several iterations because Wesley and Charlie Molnar kept changing the design. <laughs> of course, every time they changed so the design, I was back. So literally, it was the one of the. It was a computer-aided design of the link done on the TX2. It wasn't computer-aided design the way you think of it today, where you do oh, graphics and things. But no, no, it was just internal instruction sets. Yeah, the TX2 was a, mu a much, much bigger machine. It was much faster. It had a, a very sophisticated instruction set. It had 36-bit word. So you could do a lot with it. Um, when it by way of simulating a much smaller machine like this. And the TX2 was, was like the TX0 and TX2, they were sort of installation machines. They weren't very portable. They were definitely not portable. Not portable. They were huge. No, they were they were huge. Yeah. 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 The TX2 had the, had the pre-marked tapes, yeah. which the link tapes, you know, they were doing the link tapes were the same idea, so tiny. The, I hear the link tapes speaking to us oh, now. Yes, they're starting to warm up. They do. Yes, they do. You get a lot of you get a lot of feedback from the link because it the tapes moved. Yeah, the registers were, and so you feel well, yeah. it's a very easy machine to work with because you have all that you can. Yeah. You get used to certain patterns of sounds and lights, and so you know everything's working the way it's right. supposed to. Right, right. It's very reassuring. Yeah. You don't get this. What I get now all the time on my laptop drives me crazy. Is this not responding? Yeah. You hit a key and it just decides you're going to yeah. wait, <laughs> and it doesn't tell you why it's not responding, and it doesn't give you any other feedback. And it drives me crazy. Drives me crazy. But, no, you didn't get not responding, but you would get tape motion. You would get, yeah. So what is what is your feeling? Yeah. Sorry, Alan. Your your general when you when you saw the link here, what did you? Oh, it was wonderful. You, you it was wonderful to see it. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. It's this is really so exciting, you know. And the four guys who the four guys who have worked to get this thing here and get it working, you know, who really made this all possible for the rest of us to come and, and enjoy. It's that's really, it's really <laughs> exciting. And we've had the best time. We had the best time doing it in the 60s. Mm -hmm. We all we just always had a good time. We worked all kinds of crazy hours. We ate all kinds of terrible food. But we had the best time. You know, morale was great, and we've been, we've had the best time getting ready for this here. And, and one last question: 
there was like a software industry for the link in the sense that when people send tapes around of programs that they had yep. written and stuff, yep. Yep. Like, it was kind of like an open source, yep. kind of homebrew yep. Yep. Uh, movement. Yep. It was running by the mid-60s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It lent itself readily to that, partly because of the tape size, partly because everyone was encouraged to learn as much as they could about the machine themselves. Right, right. You know, so they could write code. They could. There were ways built into the operating system so that the user could interact directly with the operating system. They could write their own programs. And there was one of the meta commands um, was what we called the free meta command, and they could specify that any way they wanted, and it would just exit gracefully from lap six and and leave the coding information so they could get back into lab 6 so they didn't have to just take the tape off or, you know, do awkward things like that. So it worked, it integrated very well in their environments. There was a lot of sharing. A lot of sharing. In fact, one of the things I want to point out in my introduction is that by the mid-60s, you know, 10 full years ahead of microcomputing, was the same spirit that was going on with a machine that was portable and oriented to one person and, uh -huh. and, and it, it presaged all of that. Yeah. And that's why we're filling this hole in the history by doing this. Yeah. Yeah. So to be controversial and call it the world's first personal computer, uh, Gordon Bell calls it, it's like a workstation class machine, yeah. but that's very similar to a personal computer. The experience is the same. Yeah. Who's using it? Whether you're calling workstation or personal, workstation, I suppose. Personal, you know, yeah. I, don't, I don't, I don't see much distinction between those two. And it doesn't, that doesn't change the computer very much. So right. Yeah. Literally, the idea of one, a machine responsive to one person. You turned it off at night. Yeah. You, you loaded your programs and you shared your programs, and uh, you had a relationship with it rather than a piece of it. A time slice or a batch, or a bunch of cards, or whatever. It was dedicated to you, and it must have been a controversial thing to do at the time to dedicate computing resources to one user rather than the one. It must have been people who criticized. I think when we did it in the early 60s, it wasn't that it was so controversial. It was that it was just didn't seem a very important thing to be doing to a lot of people. Right. They were building big time uh, Either they sharing. felt this wasn't the way to go, or they they were committed to building big time share systems, right. or supercomputers, or they felt that this wouldn't be powerful enough to handle what was needed in the laboratories, right. of whatever, you know, a lot of reasons. So people just didn't, they said, that's fine, you know, go, go do your thing, but, you know, they... It, it was hard at the time to um, develop the kind of uh, conviction that it would succeed. Yeah. But I guess it wasn't hard, however, with some of the researchers at NIH. Because when I think Wes and me talk about that, when they took the first prototype link to NIH and hooked it up to Jasper the cat, and for the first time, Bob Livingston at NIH saw the auditory signals from the ear right. of his cat, his cat that he had never been able to see before and never been able to capture in any other way. He was sold. He was sold. And uh, they had literally never been able to see that data before. And he'd been trying to study the auditory responses and the auditory responses, I guess, he was using cats because they were easy, but yeah. just auditory responses in general. So it was, there were little breakthroughs like that with some key people, you know, that made it possible, that you know, led to the funding. So, you know, we went ahead. Yeah. And then by the time we got the 12 links out there at, at the end of the summer of 63, when, when this there is were, one of them, presumably. Uh, this is, a com this is a, an amalgam of the four, <laughs> of the four. that, that, that uh, Scott bought. That was part of the plan. They, you know, they, so there's a feeling I, this is sort of a 63 model. This, oh, this is definitely a classic plan. This a is classic a 63 plan. model. 63. I don't think it's exactly one of the 12. Right. The 12 went to the 12 researchers all around the country, and they used them for a number of years, yeah, the design and then the they did whatever they did with them. I don't, we didn't get them back. So we can do all that stuff. Yeah. But that's they may fine. be lying somewhere. Some, well, know. some were in use as late as the early 90s, but that, you know, that... <laughs> 
Yeah, there was one at MIT that they shut yeah. off at about 94, 95. That, uh, that was the one at um, Nelson Kang's lab at um, uh, Mass Eye and Ear Infirmary at Mass General Hospital. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the one. That's the one. one. That's and they did the ceremony. Yes. And then yes, they shut yes. it down. Yes. Yeah. The last, something about the last. The last week. Yeah. 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 <laughs> last year. Last week. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Well, this thank you good. for. I, I'm just so. We're all so thrilled that the Digi, you and the Digi Barn and you and Alan were willing to do this and interested in doing it. And yeah. it's been exciting for all of us. And I guess it's been a mutually good thing. Definitely.